It's a never new month on the channel and we're coming to you with five new films, all five of them channel points requests. And our first of the month is requested by Blade as we continue with the Scream franchise with Scream 2, released in 1997. Set two years after the first film, the events of this movie once again follow now college student Sidney Prescott. And even though the original Ghostface killers were killed in the first film, unfortunately for Sidney, it appears there's some copycats and they're out to get her again. Nev Campbell, of course, returned in the film as her role as Sidney Prescott. David Arquette also returned as Dewey Riley. Courtney Cox was back as Gail Weathers. And Jamie Kennedy was also back as Randy Meeks. Liv Schreiber also returns as Cotton Weary, this time in a more expanded role, and we also get some new additions as well. Elise Neal comes in as Hallie McDaniel, Jerry O'Connell was in as Derek Feldman, and Timothy Oliphant comes in as Mickey L. Terry. There's also a good amount of fun star power cameos as well. Louis Arquette, David Arquette's father is in this as a police chief, Jada Pinkett Smith is in this, Heather Graham has a small role, Luke Wilson has a small role, and Tori Spelling has a small role as herself. The elements of this film are very similar to the first movie. It's basically a parody of slasher films mixed in with a whodunit mystery and elements of comedy as well that heavily influenced horror movies from pretty much 96 to 2004 successfully. Wes Craven was of course back as a director and Kevin Williamson is back writing again. Unfortunately, there was a lot of issue with the writing, including the entire script at one point leaking onto the internet, completely spoiling the ending. We'll talk a little bit more more about that after the main review portion, but yeah, there was a lot of issues with stuff being leaked. There's also some controversy with the score of this movie, as Marco Beltrami was commissioned and is credited with the score of this movie, but also music by Danny Elfman and Hans Zimmer was used as well. And while Elfman's score was written for the film, they took Zimmer's contribution from a film called Broken Arrow, released in 1996, it was basically an action film starring John Travolta, and they used that music and replaced Beltrami's own work with it which is kind of a dick move. On a $24 million budget, the film also made $172 million at the box office, which is only about $700,000 less than the first film, and it was very positively received by critics and audiences, with some critics even saying that it was better than the first film. But was it better than the first film? Well, let's take a look and determine that for ourselves right now as we take a look back at Scream 2, 1997. So our film begins with two college seniors named Maureen Evans and Phil Stevens who are going to see a film called Stab, which is based off the events of the first Scream movie. Now that's meta. Everyone gets some custom ghost face masks and the theater crowd are very rambunctious, which will come into play in just a second. Maureen is initially uncomfortable as she doesn't like horror movies, but Phil's able to talk her into staying and then he goes to use the bathroom. He hears something coming from the other stall though, and probably gets stabbed for the fucking skull for trying to listen in. That's what you get for eavesdropping. Wearing a scream mask and Phil's jacket, the killer then goes and sits by Maureen, but when Maureen notices all the blood, he attacks her. The feeder goers all think it's another stunt until she stumbles in front of the screen covered in blood and stab wounds, and then they slowly realize what the hell's going on as she falls to her death. So you know how I mentioned Maureen and Phil went to college? Well, they actually went to Windsor College. Guess who else goes there? That's right, here's Sydney. Sydney shares a room with her new best friend Hallie, and they watch an interview done by Cotton Weary, who of course is the man who was originally framed for the murder of Sydney's mother in the first film. They then see another news report about the murders at the movie theater, and Sydney realizes, ah shit, here we go again. Sydney meets up with Randy, who also goes to the school alongside their friend Mickey, as well as Sydney's new boyfriend Derek. And guess who else is here to cover the story? That's right, Gail Weathers is on the scene, and she recently wrote a book on the murders that took place in the last movie, which is actually what the movie Stab was based off of. She has a new cameraman named Joel, and she's also bombarded by an enthusiastic new reporter named Debbie Salt. And she's not the only one who's back, Dewey has also flown in, and he looks great other than the considerable nerve damage he suffered after getting shot in the first film. Dewey of course is worried for Sydney's safety, and vows to catch the killer. Sydney then reunites with Gail, who springs cotton weary on her to stage their first confrontation, and Sydney don't take too kindly to that. Gail also meets back up with Dewey, who initially gives her a telling off, but it ends up backing off because he's truly a simp at heart. So later that night, Sydney and Hallie attend a sorority party. Sydney has no interest in joining, but Hallie is currently a pledge. Everybody from the other sororities at this party too, except for Cece Cooper, who's the sober sister, and she's played by Sarah Michelle Geller, who you may recognize as Daphne from the live-action Scooby-Doo. But ruh roh raggy Cece gets a call from an ominous voice asking her what her favorite scary movie is. She hears movement around the house, which ends up being one of the other sisters, who leaves the front door open, which allows the killer to just sneak in. 
And oh jeepers, there he is. He bursts right out of the closet and chases Cece upstairs where he promptly stabs her multiple times and then throws her off the fucking balcony, which is rude. The police arrive on the scene and everyone else leaves the ever sorority house to see what's going on, and Sydney and Derek decide it's probably time to leave. But like an idiot, Sydney decides to answer the ringing phone, and guess who jumps out at her? The killer chases her through the house and she escapes out the back door where she finds Derek, who runs into the house. Dewey then arrives, goes into the house himself, and finds Derek stabbed on the ground, and the killer is gone. Derek gets patched up at the hospital and interviewed by police, but they're all a little suspicious of him, considering the killer conveniently vanished right after he got stabbed. And of course, Sydney's boyfriend was the murderer in the first movie, so there's that too. Also, fun fact time here, the police chief was played by Louis Arquette, who of course is David Arquette's dad, and ended up being Courtney Cox's father-in-law. But anyway, they find out that CeCe's real name is Casey, and find out that the killer's names match up to the names of the victims in the first film. Sydney also initially says she wants to stay away from Derek, but maybe she should have taken that to heart because she doesn't the next day at lunch, and then he breaks into song. And at the end of his high school musical number, he gives her his fraternity necklace for good luck or whatever the fuck. Meanwhile, Randy explains to Dewey the rules of horror film sequels, and theorizes that the killer has to be someone that Sydney knows. Sydney, meanwhile, is a drama major, so she's doing a goddamn drama performance where she's being chased by these mass dudes or whatever, and she ends up having, you know, visions of the actual ghost face killer trying to kill her. In hindsight, maybe not the best play for Sydney. Back in the middle of the campus, Randy, Dewey, and Gail are talking about who the killer could be until Gail gets a call from the killer himself, which Randy answers, and the killer reveals that he's watching them at all times. Randy even keeps him on the phone while Gail and Dewey go around tackling random people. Randy then starts getting super animated and goes on a tangent about how much of an asshole Billy Loomis was until the killer drags him into Gail's van and stabs him to death. Sydney's got her own problems too as she gets some instant death messages on her computer and then gets confronted by Cotton Weary. So Cotton proposes that they do some kind of co-Barbara Walters interview or whatever to clear his name and give him more media attention and Sydney's not down for it and then he starts getting super aggressive and puts his hands on her and the two cops assigned to watch Sydney end up arresting him. At the police station, Sydney finds out about Randy's death and they have to let Cotton go due to lack of evidence. Things are going bad for Gail too as her cameraman quits on her and Dewey tries to walk away from her before she professes real sadness for what's been going on. After looking into her cameraman's bag, she realizes that maybe footage of the killings might have been on one of his tapes and her and Dewey go into the school and find a VCR player to see what's on them. They then start watching the tape of their argument the other day and it somehow gets them so hot and bothered that they begin making out and preparing to have sex. But then they see some alternate footage, which is not Gail's footage, and turns out whoever's filming is right behind them. Oh, and there's Ghostface. Dewey can't seem to find him, but he finds Gail and ends up chasing her throughout the school. Gail's hiding from the killer and Dewey finds her, but on the other end of some soundproof glass, and the killer finds him from behind and ends up seemingly stabbing him to death. He tries to get at Gail again, but she successfully barricaded herself in that room, and he fucks off. Meanwhile, Sydney and Hallie are being taken to a secure location by those cops, which I'm sure will be totally secure and there'll be no problems whatsoever. Also, Derek gets kidnapped by his fraternity members and tied to a cross because he gave his necklace up to Sydney, remember? Fraternities are fucking weird. So anyway, how's that drive to the secure location going? Oh wow, Ghostface attacked them and slit one of the cops' throats? Didn't see that coming. He also knocks the ever cop out of the car and gets in the driver's seat, but the ever cop dives onto the hood as he speeds off. It ends up being not such a good idea as Ghostface crashes the car and the cop gets impaled through the throat with a metal pipe. Fucking brutal. Good news though, Ghostface is unconscious. Bad news, Sydney and Hallie realize the only way out of the car is to climb right over him. But they're able to do that, successfully. Great, so they can get out of there, right? Well, not quite, because Sydney really wants to know who the killer is. But uh-oh, he's gone. Where could he be? Oh shit, there he is. And that's the end of Hallie. Meanwhile, back at the school, Gail's still trying to escape, but she runs into Cotton Weary, who literally has blood on his hands. Cotton claims it's Dewey's blood and he was trying to help him, but Gail doesn't believe him and runs outside into Debbie Salt and tries to call the police. So Sydney also arrives back at the campus, but the music from her play starts playing, which leads her into the auditorium. The set then comes down along with the cross that Derek is tied to. As Sydney tries to untie him though, the killer comes from behind and reveals himself to be their friend Mickey, 
Come on, Mickey. Mickey then tries to trick Sidney into thinking that Derek is his accomplice, but reveals that not to be the case as he shoots him for the chest, killing him. Mickey then tells Sidney his grand plan. He wants to do something that nobody's ever done before, blame violence in movies on the killings, so he can be acquitted on the grounds of insanity and get off scot-free. But you really thought Mickey was in this alone? Nah, he's got an accomplice, and it's Gail? Actually, no, it's Debbie, Debbie Salt, except that's not Debbie Salt. Sydney knows who that is. That's Mrs. Loomis. That's right, Billy Loomis's mother. Mrs. Loomis, of course, is obviously doing this for revenge, and she reveals she found Mickey on findaserialkiller.com or whatever the fuck. I guess she's gotten her money's worth at this point, though, as she shoots Mickey dead, but as he falls over, he fires a bullet, which knocks Gail off the stage. Mrs. Loomis, who's clearly just as crazy as her son was, begins telling Sydney off before Sydney escapes into the back room and just starts pulling all the levers and starts hacking away at the set until it collapses onto Mrs. Loomis. But nah, bitch, she's up and at him and she's got a knife, but don't bring a knife to a gunfight, and that's what Cotton has. Mrs. Loomis tries to talk Cotton down and tries to persuade him to let her kill Sydney in exchange for the notoriety that he desperately seeks. Cotton feigns like he's maybe gonna kill Sydney, but instead shoots Mrs. Loomis right in the throat. Cotton gives Sydney the gun and Gail gets up, and she's fine, aside from, you know, that bullet wound. Sydney gives the ever gun to Gail and she's gonna need it because here's Mickey, oh, and there goes Mickey. He's definitely dead now. And in possibly my favorite scene in this movie, and one of the most badass scenes I've ever seen, Sydney then coldly shoots Mrs. Loomis through the head, just to be sure. So the next morning, the police and the ambulances are here, and Gail's gotten patched up, and her cameraman Joel comes back, telling her to get the scoop. But then Gail catches wind of Dewey getting rolled out of there, and turns out he's still alive, and she gets into the ambulance with him instead. Reporters then swarm Sydney looking for the scoop, but she directs them towards Cotton, who finally gets the attention that he wants. Sydney then slowly walks away from this godforsaken place, hopefully for good, because fuck this school, am I right? So now, ladies and gentlemen, we have to come to a very difficult decision of ranking the first two Scream movies as we pull out our first ever Scream big board. And I gotta say, this is tough. This is really, really tough. Like, I feel like these are both pretty even films. And while this is definitely a worthy sequel, and again, I think it's a razor thin margin, and I could definitely see ranking one against the other. I mean, if you look up rankings for this, like, People are very split. It's usually between these two movies. But if I have to pick, personally, I feel like the first movie does just a little bit more for me. So I'm going to put the rankings as they are in order. Scream, number one. Scream, two. Number two. So now that we know what the ending was, let's go back to what we were talking about earlier with the script being leaked. So apparently the original script actually had four killers, and it was supposed to be Derek, Hallie, Cotton and Mrs. Loomis, but it ended up getting leaked along with 40 pages of the plot, so they had to completely rewrite everything. Apparently, Joel and Randy also had very different roles in the original script as well, which drastically got altered as well. As a result of this, it made production very difficult. The actors were not given pages of the script until weeks before the filming wrapped, and Wes Craven actually had to write and develop some scenes as they were being filmed. And even though he originally said that that was the script, it is worth noting that in 2017, Kevin Williamson claimed that the script leaked was actually a dummy draft, which was crafted to avoid leaked details, so who knows, really. And to be honest, I like this script better because those other killers were kinda obvious. I mean, I suppose Mickey was a tiny bit obvious, but who the hell saw Mrs. Loomis coming? And they didn't need to, I feel like maybe the original script would have been over bloated, like four killers. Like, holy shit, everybody's out to get Sydney. He shouldn't have done two sequels at that point. Sydney might have just fucking offed herself right then and there if four people betrayed her. Like, holy shit. Make that three sequels, actually, as Scream 5 is coming out this coming January, and we're going to try to get Scream 3 and 4 done before that movie comes out. But in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I really, really like this film. Again, the margin is razor thin between 1 and 2 for me. This has all the elements that the first film does. I don't know, I just feel like it's so similar to the first film that I feel like the, the first film gets a little bit more for me because it did it first. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not, like, this film being similar to the first film is not a bad thing. But 
I don't know if it really brought much unique to the table, which which the first film was at the time. So that's why it gets a little bit of an edge for me. But this is a tremendous film, and it's arguably just as good as the first, if not just a tiny bit worse, and I would definitely recommend seeing it. And again, whenever we come back to Scream, we'll come back with Scream 3, which unfortunately was probably the worst in the franchise. Not necessarily a bad film, but not on par with these first two. And since this review was delayed to Tuesday, we're actually having another review this coming Saturday, which is going to be The Prestige, which I've actually never seen, but I heard it's tremendous. But that, ladies and gentlemen, is going to do it for my review of Scream 2. Thank you again, Blade, for using your channel points on this. I'll see you back this Saturday with The Prestige. Thank you guys for watching. If you liked it, be sure to like the video. If you didn't, then didn't, then don't, I should say. Uh, if you want to follow any of my social media links, they're all in the description down below. Thank you to all my patrons in the description for supporting me and my channel. I appreciate you guys. With all that being said, though, my name is Noah Taff. This has been my Scream look back at Scream 2, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.